Welcome to the intersection of technology, cybersecurity, and society. Welcome to ITSP Magazine. You're listening to a new Redefining Security podcast. Have you ever thought that we are selling cybersecurity insincerely, buying it indiscriminately, and deploying it ineffectively? Perhaps we are. So let's look at how we can organize a successful InfoSec program that integrates people, process, technology, and culture to drive growth and protect business value. Knowledge is power, now more than ever. Imperva is the cybersecurity leader whose mission is to protect data and all paths to it with a suite of integrated application and data security solutions. Learn more at imperva.com. Asgardia by WSO2 is a developer-focused identity and access management solution. Offered as Identity as a Service, or IDAS, Asgardio by WSO2 creates seamless login experiences to your apps in minutes. Hello, you're very welcome to a new episode of Redefining Cybersecurity here on ITSP Magazine. This is Sean Martin, your host, and uh, I have to say I have... Probably the coolest job in InfoSec, talking to some amazing people, doing amazing things, and uh, today is no different. We're going to look at uh, a particular role, uh, more specifically uh, a data engineer with uh, a view into cybersecurity as well. And my guest today, Saman Fatima. Thank you, Saman, for joining. Thank you so much for having me today, Sean. Really, really glad that I could come here and then have a conversation with you. I'm super excited about this and and your your profile crossed, uh, crossed my view through the work that Carmen Marsh is doing with uh, Cybersecurity Women of the Year and uh, you've been nominated and I saw that you're a data engineer and I thought this is a cool role, a cybersecurity slant on top of that. I want to hear what Saman is doing and, and what she's up to and and how she combines those two things. Before we dig in, though, um, I have to say the, the the groups, the list of groups that you're involved with is <laughs> really impressive. And um, clearly, you you love to give back to the community. And I actually want to give you some space to do that as as you lead into the groups you're part of. Perhaps maybe a, a quick word about who you are and your your journey into your current role as a data engineer. So hi everyone, my name is Saman Fatima and uh, I am actually sitting down here and doing this uh, conversation with Sean from India. And I work as a data engineer now uh, with a Sydney-based investment bank that is Makori Group here in uh, Gurugram. And uh, that's my full-time job since uh, a year and a half now, but uh, I did my graduation in 2017 and uh, post that I've been part of this industry. I started up with identity and access management and uh, I continue to work uh, on the Gartner's tool that is SailPoint till four years. And after four years, I thought I just should add a flavor to my resume, to my career graph and uh, Fortunately, I got this offer uh, inside my organization only as part of an internal mobility. And I readily looked up like, what is the role about? What are we actually working on? And the one thing that really crossed my path was creating a data-driven organization. That's the main, main mission of my team. And that's something was really fascinating me that I have worked with data, but now I will work on data. Like, that's something I will analyze. I will do all th- types of uh, work on it and then send it across to the further reportees or functions. And that's something that's my full time job as a data engineer from a DevOps engineer. So I've just reversed my role as a data engineer and work on data. But apart from that, uh, I can't uh, leave my roots with cybersecurity. I am a full time time passionate enthusiast for cybersecurity. I do not hold a degree or a certificate or anything of that sort, but that's something that really fascinated me in the last year of my undergrad, where I was introduced to a couple of subjects 
and that really you know drew my attention that okay this is this this is that this is breach this is cryptography and what all but that was just done in a very small room and in just one semester and one couldn't learn much about it so when i was exposed to identity and access management i drilled down and i knew all other eight domains and then i came across a lot of communities in picture and to be honest there are many communities which really help you here being a novice you actually can learn a lot from the people in the industry and being part of communities which really uh, offer you a platform uh, in 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 the form of events conferences uh, trainings or you know get you that exposure so that's why you see a long list of communities under my name and i just uh, if i had to talk about all of them the one point of commonality between all of them is they are women based communities um and uh, a lot of them are women based communities few of them are uh, diverse communities which have men women and other genders as well and uh, but the one thing that i'm really really passionate about is you know growing with all these people either a beginner or a middle a uh, level person in their uh, you know job or even a c level executive so learning from all of them so i lead i am the management lead and vice chair of board for bbwic foundation that's uh, the foundation uh, we started up with in january 2021 and now it's a non profit and won avia award for an, for the best non profit organization so that's the organization that really envisions leaders and they help women in their mid career senior career or transitioning career or beginner career to go ahead into cyber security uh, everyone knows here about uh, ovasp and we are part of different chapters different locations and different other groups as well so i'll not talk much about oas that's all well said about it and everybody would know about it because whoever starts with cyber security they start up with the top 10 oas and know more about all those things so that i'll not cover about and uh, i'm also part of women in cyber security the global channel and uh, i started up with the india affiliate i am the member of india affiliate and women in cyber security has given me grounds for a lot of things uh you know being part of career fairs i am actually part of uh, the mentorship program being a mentor and mentee at the same time to actually learn under a leader and actually i have five university folks under me who i give training and help and what all things i have learned from my experience i actually tell them and help them and a lot of them have actually cracked jobs did a lot of uh, cyber security certification so a lot has actually come into picture and uh, i am the ambassador for sneak as well so sneak has started this program of ambassadors where they would like to make them expose to the projects of sneak and also want us to actually have things you know showcase for sneak learn it and then put it forward in front of the community so that everyone knows about it uh, to be honest it's not something uh, which every organization does to let any external person in and know about all those tools and processes and let them have a view point of that and uh, i am a volunteer instructor at cyber preserve uh, community as well that's a community founded by astha sani and uh, she envisions to have everyone that beginner level of cyber knowledge and i being part there uh, did a lot of sessions for few candidates on identity and access management making them understand that particular domain so i know i spoke a lot but these communities have a lot actually to talk about but it's just in a limited way how i have just consolidated but they're like amazing communities and there are others as well which are there in the picture as well having different visions missions uh, i would love to explore them as well but yeah for now uh, these were the main highlights of what all i have been doing with the communities and a great great list there many many of which we are already familiar with and we Uh, learned of, learned of a couple more through you which uh, I really appreciate uh, specifically BBWIC which is breaking barriers women in cybersecurity um, 
a lot of great work being done with that. And of course, we're going to put links in the show notes to all of these organizations that uh, you have, have highlighted here. Um, what I want to do is kind of switch over to the, the work that you're doing. So you talked about ident- identity and access management. You talk about cybersecurity, which um, AppSec, uh, obviously part of OWASP, having that view, and clearly looking at data. Now, as a data engineer, th- those three things combined probably gives you an interesting perspective for how you do your work as a data engineer. And maybe if I could ask this question to start, um, what what is the role of a data engineer? Because you described a data-enabled business. So see, I have been coming down from a background of being a DevOps engineer, working solely on identity and their accesses and how it should be maintained and everything. Being exposed to data uh, like a year back, that was something uh, really you know new for me. That was a newer experience with newer tools and everything. So uh, I pretty much started as being a you know data analyst, working on the dashboards and how actually you visualize data statistically and what sort of you know what sort of look and feel should come as per the customer requirements. What that dashboard should look like. So uh, that was the first I'm gonna, thing. I'm going to pause you. Sorry. Can can you describe who who the customer is of that data, and kind of okay. don't, don't share too many secrets. But um, <laughs> where where is the data coming from? What things are you trying to identify okay. or explore or present as a story? What tell tell me a little bit about that. Okay, so when I just say about data, that could be any source of data. So that could be your HR data that you want to visualize it in a way, or it could be rather identity data that you know you want to have the historical nature of the identities put across in that dashboard. So your sources could differ in that way, but how you want to look and feel and how the look data should look like, process like, or run like should is actually something so you know the customers require that okay this is a set of data this is the hr data we have zillion columns zillion rows and we want to just see it as this so these are the vague requirements which come or maybe when there are better requirements like structured requirements when it comes like you know um, these are the number of levers we have in our organization uh, those who have uh, you know left the organization for this reason that reason and we just want to visualize that on a dashboard so this is the form of data that we get across and the sources may change as per the customer as per the requirement that that's the thing And I should not say customer, but basically business requirements. How does it comes from what all businesses? So, you know, that is the end result when you want to see that data in that form. But when we talk about an engineer, what a data engineer actually does is there could be a lot of uh, custom requirements which comes down. Like, for example, if we just have the HR data as our source. Uh, what we see at the dashboard end is something at the very end that you know everything happened swiftly and you are able to see that data. But what happens in between is something that the data engineer takes care of and then hands it over uh, to the team who can just visualize it, create those dashboards, you know, assemble it likewise as the business requires. So, you know, uh, as my day to day job is that I am exposed to a lot of tools and a lot of data tools and there's no end to that. And every day there's some other new tool coming. So the uh, entire Hadoop suite is something that we use. And that's, uh, I guess, every data person would know more about uh, that. The Hadoop environment where you actually run your queries and everything, either in Impala or in Hive you use that and you create your data sets so data sets are nothing but what data you want to use for should be actually created in a data set which may be even done on a tool given by your organization or any public tools as well where you want to create that data like uh, you know if you want just you got a data of 100 and you just want to test everything on the 50 rows so just you create that data set feed it across and then you know 
create those pipelines so when we talk here about the pipelines we're actually talking about how you're actually ingesting that data and when you ingest that data into the pipeline how it should come out as and there are also you know requirements as that we want this dashboard to be refreshed like it should pick up refreshed data three times a day or four times a day at this particular time zone we want this done to be at the sydney time zone or us time zone or maybe europe time zone so all these types of things you then just put it across in your code files at the back end that the data should run at these these hours morning evening afternoon night whatever so all that things goes into picture and then you query a lot of data you take the dump of that data and see what is the result for it what actually you are seeing across and uh, what the business has actually required you to see if they want to see an apple that should come at the end and not anything else so you have to assemble your data ingest it and then transform it in a way that it comes down to the dashboard in that phase so that's my full time job and that took me a lot of time to actually learn all of these things and see how that visualization ingestion transformation actually happens and you see those uh, dashboards being successfully run is and you know you are extracting data at regular inter intervals so that's how the transformation of me as a devops engineer to to a data engineer took place and it's been going good so far like i'm enjoying working on data uh, that's a it's a really cool role <laughs> i yeah I, uh, <laughs> I i have the pleasure of uh teaching some students uh security analytics um as part of a course that they're part of their MBA that they're doing. And anytime I can help describe how to tell a story with data, and obviously I'm looking at it from a security perspective, uh, it's super fun. So I, I really enjoy that. So I mentioning cybersecurity, and I, I don't know what's the connection to your work. And is there anything specific around the IAM space, the identity part that uh, you bring with you? How how do you or do you even help mm -hmm. define or describe what's possible by having access to the data? And perhaps when you when you create the stories, do you do you leverage your security background to say only this data should be showed for these roles and that type of thing? Um, so when we come down to the cyber end, and obviously we are playing with data, and we're playing with you know data of the organization that may have a lot of information red information uh, and how do we want to scrutinize it or protect it so the first and foremost thing is uh, what we have done you know uh, being a data being part of data it's always said that whenever you are actually ingesting data into the pipeline you're using some data there has to be some security assessments in place and by security assessments what i broadly mean is if your data whatever data you are using across um has to go like has to has has a lot of data that has to undergo pen testing or has a lot of data which uh, has to go across uh, you know vulnerability testing and you're using certain data or uh, the data plus when you feed it across your scripts any language that you use any scripts that you use any executable files that you use for it to run it or anything of that sort that has to go through all those tests so as part of my team as well we also do all those tests so once those scripts are set up those executable files are there in place that data is there we just have to do those security assessments as well and that goes to a specific team who does all those tests for us as a third third team and it's their reports that they created that this is the data um, and you know they have columns there for you know this data is high medium low and it's either red amber or green what all sorts of they give out in their report and at last we get to know okay this is 
this can be taken forward it has passed the security assessment so all those tests are also part of that and we get results for it like for example i can just give you a very short example that you know uh, as part of your entire process if you're using a specific tool and uh, you know you list it down in your request and then the team just gets back to you saying the tool that you're using is an older version and we would want you to upgrade to a higher version and then do all of your tests again and share everything again here as part of the request so that's how we actually plug down that okay we're using an older version and then we have to up upgrade ourselves do the test again with every higher version there are a lot of other features and the ui and everything changes so that's the thing we do end to end that we do not send the data as it is but the entire pipeline every time you change your codes pipeline executable files that has to be done in this way and that i suppose is a very good way that something is a process that should be there intact when you are using data when you're ingesting that data and uh, that's how you should end to end test everything that nothing is red here everything goes green and thumbs up here uh, answering to your second question that is uh, identity and access management and how i link it up and how much of that experience actually works up here with my current role is um as a devops engineer i was as i mentioned i was working on gartner's tool that is salepoint and uh, that is a very very famous tool when we come across identity and access management that's you know the tool which offers you maximum functionalities and i have worked on many many versions of salepoint actually um i've seen an older version as well to the current version where things have dynamically changed like they have progressed really really well and a lot of things which were really fussy in the older versions they were really really great in the newer versions so when i talk about salepoint when i talk about identity and access management we're actually dealing up with that data of identity and their accesses and when i talk about identity and access it's what like uh, someone should just have access on to uh, you know read she should just have read access to all all those documents but shawn on the other hand will have read write and executable accesses so it's it sounds really basic here but when you have a whole lot of organizational data and when you have to see that okay someone has now resigned and her read access should be revoked so there comes the issue of the deprovisioning is something that we're still you know considering as a challenge that you know if a starter has come worked for a lot of years then left the organization but their accesses do remain into the system for a longer uh, period of time and they could actually take advantage of that so deprovisioning is one of the hanging end on that side and uh, i bring a lot of uh, experience on the table for the data end as well because you know when you have the source as sale point you actually need to know a lot about the tool so that was the plus point for me when the source was what i did worked on for the past 4 years so that's something i know the tool in and out i know the functionalities i know how things look on the other side and how you have to make it look on the data end as well when you create those pipeline so that was the thing that i carried on from myself from my older experience and you know the data and everything is what i was exposed to like brand new and how did i bring up sale point as a source and then learned everything forward with everything you know from cyber to tests to data ingestion transformation and then how you visualize that data so that's the full package of you know having your uh, iam thing and then the data thing merged together and uh, working on that yeah that, i'd love that and let's talk about kind of the differences between teams and i don't know if there are any but for for your devops role for example um i don't know if those were if that was a role building applications for use internal for the organization or for external customers um i'll say a proper devops role is mm -hmm. the the outcome is an application i, I presume or some some system versus yeah. a data engineer role which is some visualization of the data which 
is presented probably through some interface. Um, I don't know if you create the interface as well or if it's through a standard interface that you're visualizing through or some plugins. What I, I guess what I'm trying to understand is when an organization looks at those two different roles, does one have a higher level of scrutiny in terms of these are great engineering practices, not DevOps or data engineer, just engineering practices. And these are the best cybersecurity practices and these are the best performance practices and, and whatnot. So my, my sense is maybe a DevOps team building an application might have a little more with it, with scrutiny comes support maybe, or support comes scrutiny versus a data engineer, which maybe you're a little more free to, to do some things without that, that level of uh, formality. I, I don't know if that's correct or not, but what, what are you seeing in terms of, of those differences? <laughs> So um, I, I'll talk about the DevOps role first because there I've spent uh, the maximum number of years when I take up my entire experience. So um, that is, I would say, more crucial because um, when we talk about an organization and when we talk about your role, if you're into that DevOps role and if you're into identity and access management, I'm not talking about any other domain, but just uh, uh, restricted to identity and access management, that you're actually dealing directly with your identities, the organization's identities and their accesses. So they would have access to a server room or they would have access to a critical, uh, you know, piece of a thing or an environment or a, you know, a developer based environment, the production environment where actually the code files are there. And if you just delete it, drop it, anything, you know, you're all gone. So, you know, that is a very, very crucial part when you work as a developer on that end, when you have all sorts of uh, privileged accesses. Um, so that is one thing that is to be counted on. And as a DevOps role, obviously, you just interchangeably, uh, you know, sorry, you know, one for a, for a while you work as a developer, then for a while you work as an operational person, when you operationalize the business and what all things have been actually ingested and how you, uh, bug, how you maintain those fixes, bugs and everything of that sort. So I have played the role on both the ends. I have actually uh, developed few uh, snippets of code, pushed it, you know, tested everything, then pushed it across into the production and seen a lot of things. Yes, there have been moments when, you know, my tests have failed miserably in the production, uh, less they were working really fine in the lower environments, but God forbid what happened, but yes, that is something, you know, when you have pushed something into the production and they just start misbehaving, that's where the ops people and the team come into picture, that they have to fix those bugs, they have to operationalize everything that, you know, if since yesterday you did just see an apple, how did two apples come on the screen? So it should not behave like that. So if that's not the normal behavior, if an identity had two accesses in the organization and just one day they just lost those two access without any notice, without anything, and they're not able to enter into the premises. So that's something you have to look across what just changed in few hours or few days. So that's really critical when you just think about it and be in that shoes that, you know, you have to develop those things to work properly. And then if it goes off the lane, how you identify it, how is your response time towards it and how do you just, you know, resolve it? So that's in totality, I would put as first for data. I, I think I am too new to comment much on it because it's been just a year. But yes, I would also say that when you take a source and you want to have that same source in your uh, data hub as well. So, you know, if your source is having thousand records, your side should also have thousand records, what you ingest, transform and what you see it on the dashboard. So if a person is just using the Power BI and, you know, launching those dashboards and everything, so they should see those tally that if there's thousand at the source end where we pick that data it should see up here as well but it goes through a lot of test on that end as well but in terms of criticality and in terms of uh, 
you know the crucial data that is exposed to i would still prefer identity and access management on that end devops role is more crucial when you you know launch a lot of uh, processes and everything and you see a lot of discrepancies in identities and uh, the same discrepancies which you see may happen may happen at the data end as well so you know i would i would weigh that uh, like devops role is more more crucial because we're directly dealing up with identities and their accesses when granted access to a data source are you granted access as an individual or as an entity that you're acting through as the individual okay um like what i've usually seen so far in my career is that we get access as a group so we part of one group and you know your team members are under that group and that group gets that access so you know uh, what we call in the sale point language is a bundle that's the technological term from the tool that means when you know you want to give maximum people the same access so you bundle them together and you just give that bundle the access so if i want to give that bundle read access so if you me two three more folks are part of that bundle we could get that access together so it could be a uh, read access write access or directly admin level access that they could do anything with that data or um it's also done individual at individual uh, like at user level as well that this particular user is fairly new to the process so they should only see or have read level access and they should not be able to execute anything or deploy anything into the environment they can just visualize it so yeah so it's basically done at the group level and i agree if you're part of that group directly you can get access to the group and uh, you'll get directly those access if not you can individually get read write or executable access and is that granted to the source directly or through some abstraction layer or uh does it say this group can access that data with read only writes via only this api uh through this machine or what what does that look like okay so uh from the source it's just we take the data but when we talk about permissions and if you want to give extra a uh, grants to somebody else or directly to a group so what we actually do is and uh, what i've heard from a lot of folks into data as well that you create an environment similar to it and get those accesses all replicated on that end so that you're actually not disturbing the source you're not actually playing up with the source you've just duplicated that in your data environment not in the source environment but your data environment has the same replicas of data in the form of tables and you directly copy the database to your replica environment that is your data environment but you do not touch the source you're not playing anything across with the source you just get the dump of data and have it here and then play across with that data and obviously that goes without saying that if the source data is getting refreshed thrice a day your data should also get refreshed thrice a day so that you maintain that sync so many things here to uh to explore <laughs> i'm sure um what i'd like to do is we're coming up uh close to the time uh clearly you're involved with and we've we've listed a few groups that uh perhaps data engineers or others uh might be interested in exploring uh, owasp and and uh oasis and others um beyond the groups uh specifically speaking to data engineers now what's what's one or two things that you would suggest they do to get a flair of cybersecurity as part of their data engineering role what what should what should they look at for obviously you have a lot of background in IAM but what what areas should they look at mm-hmm. okay um so if you're entirely very new into data um I would not say that you know you have to be really an expert or anything I wasn't I was like zero when I started up with data year year back but I would tell you my experience what really worked for me and how did I have my 
foot across in this area uh so the first and foremost thing is uh, whatever language you are working on like for example in my organization i work on python and uh, getting used to those libraries getting used to those versions and everything and playing across with that data and then creating small small snippets using those libraries and everything that's very important and knowing that language because being a data engineer you have to actually play across with code as well and you have to you know actually i would say uh, dirty your hands and uh, play across with all those things via codes as well creating those things because you have to ingest that data and then that is the thing uh, nevertheless if you want to become a data analyst as well you have to have uh, you know control over a lot of tools like visualization tools like power bi and all tricks and all those things and know in and out about them and how you can connect them with the source so your source may vary uh, whatever source you are connecting up with and how you want to visualize that data so that basic is very very important and uh, uh, also uh, when we talk about data engineering and then having that intersection of cyber security uh, you know what all terms that i did mention that you know during security assessments as vulnerability test pen test and identity checks and everything so knowing the basics of it what may go wrong if there comes something regarding that those reports become read how is it affecting your data so knowing those criticalities is also important but knowing nothing is something really dangerous i would say so uh, you know there are a lot of courses on a lot of platforms actually on data engineering and how does it affect us and everything of that sort involving a lot of other elements as well uh, regarding data sorry elements as well regarding to data and uh, probably going through that and understanding that will actually let you know that you know we actually play across with a lot of data in our daily lives and how do we use it uh, analyze it and you know implement it at different areas is something you have to understand so it's just the data maybe if i just give you an example is the social media data that the social media that you traverse across every day it generates tons and tons of data so you know you have a lot of data across you how you want to structure it is something that we do as part of data engineering and yes cyber can never leave any area because that's very important where comes data where comes your organization's red data there you are like you're like clean bolt because anything happens any low hanging end there and you know it's just you lose a lot of data to an external entity so understanding the basics across the uh, things are very very important i i'm thrilled to have had this conversation with you and what I think my main takeaway here is that you are, I don't know if I can make a fun uh, CICD or CDCI or whatever joke, but you're, you're constantly learning and breaking barriers. So see a constant learning, constant breaking. Um, and I know that's one of the organizations you're, you're part of as well, but I, I think the, the main thing is are, you've not stopped. You've, you've, looked at DevOps, you looked at cybersecurity, you looked at data engineering, you're bringing those together. I'm, I'm excited to see what barrier comes next that you're going to uh, crash through and, and take to the next level. And hopefully other data engineers listening can uh, be inspired and, and take to heart the, the cybersecurity advice that you're uh, providing. And of course, there are groups that you're going to share. And I know you mentioned uh, some courses, maybe, maybe there's one that stands out that you can can send us we can include a link to that as well um, sure. it's all about uh, helping each other learn and uh, and break through our own barriers and hopefully in the process redefine cyber security as well so Saman, it's a pleasure chatting with you thank you so much for uh, for joining me today thank you so much sean for having me it's really a great time with you Asgardia by WSO2 is a developer-focused identity and access management solution. Offered as Identity as a Service or IDAS, Asgardio by WSO2 creates seamless login experiences to your apps in minutes. Imperva is the cybersecurity leader 
whose mission is to protect data and all paths to it with a suite of integrated application and data security solutions. Learn more at imperva.com. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Redefining Security Podcast. If you learned something new and this podcast made you think, then share itspmagazine.com with your friends, family, and colleagues. If you represent a company and wish to associate your brand with our conversations, sponsor one or more of our podcast channels. We hope you will come back for more stories and follow us on our journey. You can always find us at the intersection of technology, cybersecurity, and society.